Hi, hello everyone. Welcome to this session of my NPTEL course, Appreciating Linguistics, a Typological Approach. So, um, by far we have uh, discussed um, like typology at various levels. We have discussed lexical typology, morphological typology, syntactic, semantic, pragmatic, as well as phonological. So, all these whatever we have been discussing so far, that is at the synchronic level. So, uh, we, we are trying to find out what is how, wh what sort of cross linguistic generalization can be drawn at the current level, at the present time, at the ta ongoing time. So, that is why we call it synchronic. So, considering lot of discussion has happened um, on the structural, uh, in the structural domain of world's languages um, at the synchronic level, I am trying to um, move to a different direction uh, for this particular unit, which is titled as typology and language change. So, when I say language change, um, you can you can figure out, you can understand that I am going to talk about what are the different or what are the different domains where we observe change in the use of language, change in the structure of language and to make it more clear uh, for, for this particular unit, my focus is going to be on the historical uh, perspective and the developmental perspective. So, either historical or developmental. So, when I say historical, I am going to approach it from a diachronic perspective. When I say developmental, I am going to talk about the child language acquisition for that matter. How things have changed or how, how language develops um, from uh, like how language develops for a human being starting from the uh, very beginning stage like uh, from the one word, two words babbling stage or stuff like that, right. So, um, one aspect of this unit would deal with developmental changes, the other aspect of this unit will deal with the diachronic or the historical changes. So, that is why I will, the, the unit is titled as typology and language change. So, the change here that uh, I am going to talk about would have two different aspects. Okay. Um, so, um, these w when I say two different aspects, it will have three levels. So, what are the three levels that I am going to discuss in this unit? Again, very briefly and I would expect you to read the book, uh, the same book that I have been referring all the time, um, Introducing Language Typology and uh, that is uh, that's written by uh, Edith Morabsik and then it is published by Cambridge University Press. So, uh, when I say I am going to discuss languages, how languages change um, on three levels. The first one is going to be in the acquisition level, use level and in the course of history level, right. So, uh, these are the three different parameters, so these are the three different levels where we are trying to find out what sort of cross linguistic generalization can be drawn as far as language change is concerned from a typological approach, ok. And what are the major questions you might um, expect to be answered or to be discussed? Let us say um, historically, for these are just, just some kind of um, indicative questions. The questions could be even broader than that. Uh, or you, you might think about some other linguistic phenomena, but to be to make it a little more specific and uh, uh, the, to lead the discussion towards a specific area. So, the first question that you might expect to get an answer is that what do you think historically, how do articles come into existence in any given language? For example, in this case it is English. So, uh, in English for Odia for that matter which is an Indo-Aryan language, Hindi which is an, which is an Indo-Aryan language, we do not have articles, but English does have. So, if we approach um, languages like English, any language which hosts any kind of article, the first question that you might um, seek for an answer is that how do articles come about in history? What is the historical pathway by which languages which have articles, they had articles? And the second question uh, that I might uh, touch up in, in the uh, due course of discussion is that how does the word order change? So, sometimes SOV becomes, become 
uh, SOV becomes SVO or vice versa depending on the situation. So, how does that happen? So, that is also a historical question. So, the first and the second questions are uh, based on the historical evidence or the historical discussion. Third question is how does like how are the antonyms and special terms acquired by children? This is an acquisition based question. Then the fourth one what characterizes the interlanguages of second language learners? Again acquisition uh, based question. So, what do you think uh, what are the characteristics of interlanguages um, in case of the second language learners? And finally, what processes are involved or what processes are evident in language use? So, when you say um, you are going to talk about language use, so what do you think what are the different processes involved in such situation? So, again uh, I am just going to uh, these are the questions which have been discussed in Morabzik's book and that is going to be indicative, uh, but we will we'll definitely try to uh, find out some answers, some potential answers which this question, uh, these questions might deal with. Okay? Um, so, uh, now since now let us go back to some introduction based discussions. So far uh, in this course, we, we have talked about the cross linguistic recurrent patterns in the synchronic structure as I just mentioned, be it syntax, semantics, morphology, phonology, pragmatics. We have always been talking about um, cross linguistic generalizations at the, at the present time which is also known as synchronic level. But the question here is that language is dynamic and it keeps evolving. So, if it if it keeps evolving then we also have to uh, have a look um, at the process of language evolution or, or how language is changing. I am not really going to go back to how a language evolution happened not really, we will just try to find out using certain linguistic phenomena as tools if we can find out how tiny changes are happening in, in natural language or in human language. For instance, um, look at the phonetic inventory of today's English. It has been very, very different how it used to be in the early 15th century or even uh, older than that, right. So, the phonemic inventory of today's English has gaps. So, what kind of gaps? It does not contain certain sounds that other languages have. For example, I um, will give you an, uh, uh, like a difference between Hindi and English. Let us say Hindi has a, um, has a sound, um, let us say the, the dental, the dental the sound is not available in English. It would either be t or it is going to be th, but then the th dental th is not available in a language like English. Similarly, some other some other sounds like uh, fricatives, let us say um, uh, let us say fricative English has labiodental fricative like th as in thick, right. So, alveolar fricative like s as in seal and palatal fricative like sh as in sheen, but the velar fricative something like German has. Okay? So, uh, that that is that does not uh, occur in English or the dental sound uh, th that does not occur in English. right? Um, so, I am not sure about the dental sound th, but at least the German, um, German, German uh, uh, velar fricative it used to be in old English, but gradually it has uh, uh, like the phonetic the phonemic inventory has lost it. right? So, and how, how, how do the linguists claim that it used to be there? Because the traces are, um, are still preserved in the silent g h in night and light. Okay? So, when you say laugh um, in German uh, that is going to be a different sound, but then when you say light and night g h that is silent. So, why is it silent? that could have been some connection with the way the phonetic inventory of English is changing. right? So, uh, this shows that there has been a process of phonological loss spanning the centuries of old English, which is gradually morphed into the modern variety. So, the, this, the, this change of losing certain sounds, addition of the new sounds, these are all coming under the domain of, um, of uh, let us say uh, what we say, the, the historical or the diachronic um, historical change in any given language. So, um, considering we, we just uh, we, we are discussing about how or we are discussing how the sound changes occur um, in a diachronic 
fashion or in a diachronic manner. So, uh, starting from the German Wheeler fricative H, Lachen, if I am not sure if I, my apologies for my weird pronunciation in German because that is a language I do not know at all. So, this H sound which is the Wheeler fricative, it used to be in English, but it does not exist anymore. So, there has been a phonological loss or there has been a phonological change um, when old English is, uh, is moving towards the modernity, right. So, uh, these kind of changes or these kind of differences um, should be accounted for. So, at the synchronic state, um, the cross linguistic convergence is ok, but we have to find out typologically if we can come up with some, uh, some generalization as far as historical changes are concerned. And the, the, the bigger question is historical change, um, do you think we can come up or we can suggest some sort of cross linguistic recurrent pattern available? Is it possible for the linguists to find out uh, a cross linguistic pattern how language change is happening in various world's languages? So, uh, if we take into account this Wheeler fricative H um, as in German, um, do, do you think some other languages have also go, gone through similar kind of changes? That is one question, right. So, uh, let me just write it over here. So, this is uh, um, the example that we are uh, talking about that is laugh, ok. So, this is um, the change here that we are discussing is Wheeler fricative, ok. So, what are the questions? Question number 1, it could be does any other language or not, not does, maybe has, has any other language, let me write it quickly, uh, gone through. similar change, that is one question. The second question would be, what are the other changes? What are the other changes lang uh, uh, languages have gone through? This is another very significant or important question. Then we have um, questions like, do you think languages, oh, I will write it, do languages gain new sounds and uh, do you think, let us say, um, uh, if it is, if you are talking about the new sounds, do you think um, and all these kinds of changes. How do, how, how, how do they happen? How do the changes happen and why? Okay. So, these are uh, some of the crucial questions that linguists try to uh, find the answers um, for. Okay. So, now when you look at it or when you are trying to find out um, in, in such cases, just one example we uh, got is the Wheeler fricative as in German. So, immediately the questions should come to your mind is that do you think there is any other language which has also lost the Wheeler fricative from its phonemic inventory or if not it is it's not only about the Wheeler fricative there could be some other changes which the languages have gone through. And do you think um, it is possible for us to find out a cross linguistic a recurrent pattern to identify if um, some other changes have also happened in the due course of time. The third question, besides losing sounds, do you think languages also gain new sounds? That is also very, very relevant question, right. So, it should not be, it should not always uh, move towards losing things. You might also have um, an aspect of gaining new, uh, new sounds or gaining new words for that matter. So, do you think languages also gain new sounds? And finally, whatever changes happening, this losing and gaining and changing of the um, semantics, whatever, all kinds of changes which are happening in the due course of time in the diachronic manner or in a diachronic fashion, 
how do they happen how do the changes happen and why do they happen so these are a few questions that we should um, ask um, to ourselves as linguists and language enthusiasts okay but remember whatever historical changes happen they do not affect to an individual rather these changes affect the entire community so whoever is speaking that language the speech community entirely um, that gets affected by such changes it's it's not about one particular person rather you need to find out um, like maybe and when when i say it is affecting the entire speech community the root cause could be small individuals usage change in the small individuals usage but that small change accumulate to bigger changes in the flow of language right um, so th that that's about the historical aspect or historical change of historical method of um, change in language and and um, in the uh, in a typological fashion but how what happens in the development level i told you one is historical level or historical domain the other one is developmental uh, domain and these two domains can be conflated into three different levels so one is acquisition second is use and then th third one third is diachronic aspect okay so um as a child we acquired the language and we constantly draw upon this acquired knowledge for comprehending and speaking that's that's a fact and every like we, all of us we know about it so we acquired the language it could be any language it's it's our first language it could be english french german chinese hindi odia or whatever so um after we acquired the language what did what purpose did we or what was the result of this acquisition we started using it and in what case why did we use it we used it for comprehending and speaking so to convey our message and to understand others messages also so um this language acquisition which is a process of going from no language to language right so generativists will have a different approach altogether so they wouldn't say that there was any stage in a human where you didn't have any language if you're a human language has been innate and it has been inbuilt into your um, brain uh, just because you are a human child so following the formal or the generativist approach we are not going to um, we are not going to go into this debate but at least if you look at the functionalist approach so when the child was born the child was not speaking but eventually the child acquired the language so if we believe in something like from no language to language or from one language to the second language and from second language to the multiple languages in all kinds of stages this process of language acquisition and language use at the at the two additional areas where cross linguistic similarities may be sought right right so um since i was talking about uh, uh, historical and and uh, uh, development under the domain of development we have two different levels and what are these levels one is the acquisition level the other one is the use level so when you say acquisition level the child uh, so from the no language to language from one language to the second and second to multiple languages if you are a multilingual speaker then um, this entire process of language acquisition and language use are the two new areas or the two uh, additional areas where cross linguistic similarities may be may be may be sought for the uh, from the typological perspective okay so um now let's see um so one is historical the other one is language acquisition and the third one is language use so uh, in the category of historical change as i mentioned um it affects the entire community and the this affecting the entire community this process begins with one individual's single change like the change of a single individual's lifetime right so the way you are using this language that's going to contribute to the change in the whole lang lang linguistic uh, like that that's going to contribute to the change through this linguistic community or the speech community and uh, in the language acquisition we are going to check or we are going to see how this process involves from no language to one language and from one to multiple and when you when you are talking about the language use so uh, you are mainly trying to find out how knowing a language is going to help you to comprehend and to communicate with others so the three levels and the potential questions that we are going to um, discuss okay now let's uh, um so considering this is a descriptive study or this is a this is just a preliminary kind of an analysis of any kind of change through historical or developmental perspective we are going to find out um 
in these uh, these domains what are the initial stage final stage and intermediate stages intermediary stages or intermediate stages um, and what sort of conditions um, do they have for the changes to occur right so uh, what are the what are the questions so all the questions that i have been that i mentioned a while ago um, what are the conditions that you should look for uh, when when we are trying to understand the uh, language change uh, from historical perspective and from um, what perspective and from the developmental perspective okay so what are the questions the first question is let's have a look at it the first question is um, i told you initial intermediate and final right so these three stages we have to uh, we have to observe or we have to figure out how the changes are happening so given let's say the final stage is b stage b if that's the final stage what are the cross linguistic recurrence recurrent a's that b can or must come from so let's assume a is the initial stage b is the final stage so the first question that you need to think about is that is there any way by which we can identify what are the cross linguistic recurrent or what are the changes that a has which results in b that means if b has something what is that essential feature that a has which help to produce b okay so b is an upshoot or b is a is the result of a for sure because a is initial b is final if b is final so b is the result of a or b is the changed form of a so in that case we have to find out what are the cross linguistic recurrent that a had which is why b could get it that's the first question the second question given a which is the initial stage what are the cross linguistic recurrent b's that a may turn into so what could be the possible things that a had and eventually it has turned into b then the third one given that a changes to b what are the cross linguistically recurrent intermediate stages what are the mediary mediary stages or what are the middle stages that have been there so that the journey has which started from a has ended with b so what are the intermediate stages that occur between a and b so maybe we can call it c so the journey is something like a c and then b so this is the um, this is the initial stage b is the final stage and c is the intermediate stage so the questions um that we need to explore i'll, I'll repeat it after a while but what is the fourth question that we need to talk about or we need to understand what are the cross linguistically recurrent conditions under which a may change into b with the mediation of c so let's th this question sound a little complicated so please don't um, feel that you are lost in the middle of the discussion so we are trying to approach the developmental stages of any given language this developmental change begins with initial stage a it ends with final stage b and c is the intermediate stage right so considering we are talking about this the first question is that given b is the final stage what are the cross linguistically recurrent a's that b can come so that means a concern okay forget about what is written over there let me explain so a must have some features or a must have some uh, linguistic elements or items which which are the reason of the res, uh, which, which are the reason of the birth of b so b must have something which has a strong correlation with a right that's the first question second one a must have some potential features which would eventually result in the production of b so that means these two questions they are one is in the at the initial stage one is at the final stage but they are interrelated so the initial stage must have something which is why the final stage has come 
and the final stage must have something oh sorry the, the final stage must be the result of some potential um, existence of the of the initial stage. Then between A when, when the changes are happening from A to B there must be a lot of other changes which have happened in the uh, intermediate level which is C. So, now we have to find out cross linguistically what are the condition which we can figure out that results the change of A to C right. So, first question is related to the initial stage, second question is related to the final stage, third is about the uh, intermediate stage and fourth one is about the conditions. So, what are the conditions that you might have that you that you require which is why A has become B here right ok. Now, let us see um, how we are going to talk about for example, let us um, let us take uh, let us take uh, the word order S V O subject, verb and object something like the English type I ate food. So, um, the question that emerges or the question that comes to mind is that what orders can SVO come from? What do you think is, is the default order is the is this the order which is the most rudimentary or it has come from something else that is one question. The second question what other orders can SVO change into? So, if you if you think that so imagine SBO as the initial order then what will be the final order? Imagine SVO is the final order what would have been the initial order right the first and the second question. Third question given that SVO morphs into VSO what orders mediate this process what are the medial things and fourth what conditions favor this change ok. So, I am going to write it over here this would be easier for you to understand. Um, Let us say this we are going to write it over here. There are multiple word orders S V O, S O V, V S O, V O S and O S V, O V S ok. These are the 6 possible word orders. Let us begin with the discussion with S V O. If we consider it as the initial stage I am going to write it as I S and let us say if S V O is uh, we, we encounter S V O. So, do you think the first question that should come to your mind where has it come from? If this is the final stage what was the initial stage? This could be one question the second question. If this is the initial stage let us say we started the uh, discussion with SVO or, or language happened with SVO and what could be the possible or the orders which can be considered as final ones. So, that is the second one. Third question now since SVO let us say SVO has changed into VSO. So, from the journey of SVO to VSO what are the other forms available that is the third question and the fourth question what could be the possible conditions cross linguistically recurrent conditions which have instigated or which have helped such kind of a change. So, consider you first think about SVO as the final order what it must have come from. Second question consider it as the initial order what are the other things which may happen later. Third question imagine that SVO has morphed into VSO in such case um, what do you think what are the other mediary or intermediate conditions and finally, what are the reasons for which or what are the conditions uh, which favored such a change. So, these are the, the these are like the questions which linguists generally try to explore right. Um, so, I, I just gave you an example, but then um, this is how or th this is like a tool through which the linguists would try to figure out or the linguists have always been trying to figure out the, um, the, the development process in any given language ok.